As an artist and maker, one of the best ways to get your work in front of a lot of people is by becoming a vendor at a local arts and craft fair. By setting up a booth at those events, you get to talk to customers face to face and get real time feedback on your work. And you get to test new products in a more reliable way than you could online. Selling at these in-person events do take a lot of preparation and it can be stressful if you haven't done it. My husband and I have been doing these fairs for about five years now. And we finally decided to take an indefinite break because now that with two kids in tow, it's just really hard to dedicate a weekend on those events. But for those of you who are just starting out, I hope that this video will take the guesswork out of a lot of your aching questions when it comes to preparing for these events. The first burning question is, what and how many of my products should I stock? This is the biggest question that new vendors I have in my experience. What I would do first is to look at your current bestsellers from online or retail sales if you have that. There's a pretty good chance that your online bestsellers will be your best sellers in person. Of course, that is not guaranteed. And sometimes the people who shop in person at this particular event just have different tastes from your typical online shopper due to the demographics. That's a safe starting point if you do have some sales history online. If you don't have enough online sales to know what your best sellers are, then treat this event like an experiment. Your goal for your first fair isn't to maximize sales, but to test if people are willing to pay for your products at the current price that you set them for. So you're basically getting that first customer validation at these events. And another plus is you get to identify your best sellers. This will provide a good blueprint from which you can continue to make products and adjust pricing if needed. Also, certain product categories will sell much better in person than online. A good example of this is greeting cards. They sell much better at in-person events than online because the price point is lower and greeting cards in general encourages more impulse on a spot purchase. When you sell something that is at a lower price point, one strategy that I find that always works is to offer bundles. By offering a discount, it doesn't have to be a big discount if they buy multiple items. Greeting cards, you can offer a buy four, get one free deal or buy five and get 25% off. I usually like to act the free in my offer because it's just more enticing and they don't have to do any math. Same thing with other small items like stickers and even small size prints. If you have a variety of products, you can even give them the option to mix and match between the different products. Just remember not to confuse the customers with too many offers at once. It can create analysis paralysis and they might just end up walking away. I recommend starting with just one clean offer. As far as how many to stock, I recommend a 50-50 rule, meaning you, you want to allocate 50% of your stock to your top three to five best sellers and the other 50% spread more widely across the other items that don't have a sales record or um, old items that are not selling as well. You probably won't get it right the first time or even the second time, but use this as a starting point and continue to tweak and optimize from your own experience at your own events. Another thing we do for larger items is that if you have a car parked during a fair that's accessible, you can hold some of your inventory there so that you don't have to take everything out and try to tug it under your booth. You want your booth to look clean and organized, so you can always keep the excess inventory in your car. If you start to run out of things, you can go to your car and do a small restock. Also, a lot of those events are multi-day, so if on the first day something sells much better than you expected, you can go home and restock. That's one of the advantages of us making all of our prints and cards in-house because we get to make them on demand. The second question is around display. How do I display my booth in a more enticing way for the customer? First and foremost, keep your display simple but inviting. What does that mean? As a new vendor, we have a tendency to want to show everything we have to offer, but that will only lead to visual clutter and analysis paralysis. Think about the customer's experience when they're shopping at a small, tidy, unclean, boutique clothing store versus going to a large and cluttered discount retail store. A more strategic approach to merchandise display 
is to showcase fewer items that will capture the customer's attention, not a bunch of items that's trying to compete for the customer's attention. You only have a few seconds to get their attention with your visual display as they walk by your booth, maybe even one second. So don't be shy about putting your best seller out there in a more prominent spot. The entrance to your booth is like the window to your store. Make it count. Also keep track of what isn't selling. If that thing that is taking up your prime real estate at your booth is not generating sales after a few hours, then it's time to boot them out and replace it with something else. The great thing about setting up a booth like this is nothing is permanent. You can always move things around and optimize as the day goes on. The third question is around payment. How do I manage different forms of payment and what's the most efficient way of going about that? We are becoming a more cashless society, at least in the US, but I always like to keep a small denomination of cash handy at those type of events. No more than no $100 in fives, ones, and tens. I like to hold the cash in a fanny pack so that it's with me at all times. But if you want to be extra safe, you can buy a, one of those portable safety deposit boxes. For credit card readers, the one we like to use is a Shopify POS card reader because the app and the reader syncs with our Shopify store so that the inventory syncs as well so that we don't risk selling out on something. I do try to have a main credit card reader and a backup in case one of them crashes for whatever reason and that does happen. We also like to bring a charger just as we don't know how long this reader is going to last even when it's fully charged. If I'm working the fair with another person like my husband, then we will each have a card reader assigned to our own phone so that we can hand off when we need to go take bathroom breaks or lunch breaks. If you don't have Shopify and can't use a Shopify POS reader, we also like the Square reader that is more platform agnostic. So you can set up Square POS reader regardless of what online platform you use to sell your work. Finally, some people will prefer to pay via a payment app like Venmo. So I like to make sure to have them installed and ready to go. We've actually gotten quite a few Venmo payments in our last couple of events. So that seems like that's definitely where the trend is going. The other payment app we use besides Venmo is Cash App and PayPal, but I would say Venmo has been the most common. The fourth question, which is not really a question, but it's definitely a strong recommendation from me is use this opportunity to collect emails. The most important thing you can do from a marketing perspective is to collect emails and continue to build your relationship with customers or potential customers. This is how you can directly access your customers who actually want to hear from you. We collect emails in the following ways during these events. First, if someone purchases something with credit card, our Shopify POS reader can request that they enter their email in order to receive a receipt. Of course, we'll get their consent. Shopify can sync up this email with the email marketing tool that we use. Uh, we currently use Klaviyo. Just make sure that you do have their consent after they're entering in their, their email that they want to opt in to your email list. Just because they gave you an email to get a receipt doesn't mean they want to continue to hear from you. And you don't want to risk getting your email flagged as spam because they didn't opt into this option. The second way we collect email is to do it the analog way. I have a piece of paper for email sign up and we like to place it next to our business cards so that as they're grabbing a business card, they may want to or sometimes feel a little obligated to put in their email address for our list. Just clearly write out what benefits they receive from signing up for this email list. Now, the last topic around preparing for these arts and craft fairs is around sales. The big scary S word. Now, I've said in other videos before, I'm an introvert, so I'm not a pro in face-to-face -face sales, but I've had to get better over time. So I just want to give you some tips that will help you if you are also like me and afraid to know, talk up to a stranger and try to sell you their work. I mean, objectively, it is a scary thing. So the first tip is you want to be approachable, but not pushy. You're likely not going to be a pushy person if you're like me, but don't lean all the way on the other side and hide behind your screen and pretend you're reading some riveting book or just scroll on social media. You want to look approachable so that when someone has a question, they can talk to you. 
What I do is kind of gauge the person's body language and how closely engaged they are with my work to decide how much I want to engage them. Most of the time, just because they make an eye contact doesn't mean I need to chat them up right away. I may exchange a smile if they're just walking by my booth, slowing down and they kept walking, that's totally okay. If they're not going in all the way and engaging and interacting with my art, that's fine too. And I usually kind of give it like 30 seconds or a minute if they're hanging out and browsing through my art then I would offer to answer any questions that they have. Sometimes they may have a specific question or they may ask what's the inspiration behind the work. So that would be an easy Q&A. Other times you may have to come up with something to engage them. Like if they're holding a print, you can let them know how this print is made or a story about how this print of this Lion was inspired by your trip to South Africa. I can't tell you how many times those contextual like background stories have led to interesting conversations with people about their own experience and background. And people are really open up and are willing to share when you are friendly and approachable. Now, when the fair first starts, the time between when the event first starts to the first sale is nerve wracking, especially if you're new. It feels like forever, even if it's only like five minutes or an hour. Instead of letting your nerves take over, I would try to take this time to tighten up on your artist story. Because keep in mind that most of the people who go to these arts and craft fairs, they're not there just to buy art. You can buy art at Target or another large retailer or online. They go there because they want to support the local economy and the local small business and the real humans behind them. So oftentimes you have to sell your story, not just the product in front of them. But I like to work in layers, right? You don't want to give your whole life story right off the bat. You want to start with the basics and if they are open to engaging further then you can start to peel your own layers of the onion and tell them about how you got started how long have you been doing it one of the interesting facts about me is that i'm a self-taught artist so you know it always surprises people and they want to know more or they might know someone or have personal experience around that don't be pushy and know that you're not going to get it right the first time or the second time. Again, with everything else that I've said in this video, it takes a lot of experimentation and being willing to fail. And that failure is not going to feel as horrible as it does in your head. One last tip around sales is if they are looking at one of your products and they're asking for a different size or variation, and you know that it's something you do offer, you're just not stocking at the event, what I do is I will hand them one of my business cards and I will write a free shipping code with their name on it in the back for them to take home so that they can order online and get free shipping. Sure, I am absorbing the shipping costs, but I think by showing that I'm going above and beyond in customer service, it will leave a better impression as they leave the event and they're more likely to buy online. And always have your business cards ready to go. And also if you are setting up a discount code, just make sure that you've already set up the code ahead of time, or you can do it on the spot on your phone too. So that's it for the topic of preparing for arts and craft fair. Comment below if you have an event coming up that you're preparing for and which tips here are helpful to you. And again, you don't have to have everything figured out. You just have to take the next step. Good luck and I'll see you in the next video.